next uh, few weeks. But we're just going to look at verses 1 to 4. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Our text for this morning. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the word of the Lord. So this past week, I came across a study from uh, George Barna. You might be familiar with uh, uh, who he is, but uh, he often uh, pulls uh, Christians and tries to keep uh, his finger on the heartbeat of the church, particularly in the United States and what's happening. Uh, So he uh, recently uh, commissioned uh, a poll where they asked uh, a series of questions, and they found that uh, 69% of the U.S. population claim to be Christians. That's just over two-thirds of people living in the United States claim to be Christian. But they also found that a majority believe that Christianity is kind of about the Bible. So we're already beginning to see a bit of a disconnect, aren't we? All right. Uh, They found a number of other things. Now, these are answers from self-professing Christians, right? That 69% of Americans who claim to be Christian. Uh, So, there we go, we'll get past this. 72% say that people are basically good. 72% of people who claim to be Christians in the United States believe that people are basically good. 66% say that having faith matters more than which faith you pursue. 64% say that all religious faiths are of equal value. Now, again, this isn't just a cross-section of uh, the nation of the United States, but this are, these are individuals who profess to be Christians. 64% say that all religious faiths are of equal value. 58% believe that if, person, if a person is good enough or does enough good things, they can earn their way into heaven. So if uh, you know, you've done more good than bad, then it weighs on the scales of justice, I suppose. And if the good outweighs the bad, off you go into heaven. And 57% believe in karma. All right? Now, I can tell you that you will not find karma in Scripture. I can guarantee you that. Uh, I can tell you that Scripture does not say that if you believe if you're good enough, that your good outweighs your bad, that you will make it into heaven. Uh, I can also tell you that all religious faiths are not of equal value. All right? Uh, I can tell you that... Uh, What you believe matters far more than simply having faith. That's significant. And I can tell you that people are not basically good. All right? So if you believe that, we can have a conversation. But Scripture is clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none good. There is no one who is righteous. But this just kind of gives you a sense of what people believe. Right? Now, I don't know what the numbers are for Canada, but... You know, we tend to say it's the same, maybe it's the same, maybe we're a little better. Uh, I can probably safely say that over two-thirds of Canadians probably would not claim to be Christian. All right? I think I might be safe uh, in saying that. But that just gives us a bit of uh, a cross-section of what's happening in that study. Uh, the study further found that only 6% of U.S. adults have a biblical worldview. 6% of U.S. adults have a biblical worldview, meaning that their beliefs matched what the Bible says because they hold the Bible to be accurate and reliable, right? So everybody has a worldview, right? We all have a way of making decisions in life, whether we've really thought about it or not, 
We all have ways that we decide what is right and what is wrong. We all have a way of approaching life. So the world of you is defined as an intellectual, emotion, and spiritual decision-making filter. So whatever kind of comes our way, it passes through this invisible grid in front of us, and um, it touches our intellect, our emotion, and our spirit, and through that, we begin to make decisions, right? Uh, this is what it includes. Now, it's kind of a big deal. If you haven't really thought about what your worldview is, I would encourage you strongly to think about what it is and uh, put some meat to it. So this is what, particularly for a believer, is very important when it comes to our worldview. What is the, ex- you know, we ask the question about the existence, the nature, the character, and the purposes of God. Because who God is will influence the rest of our lives, right? And and please know our theology must always begin with God first and come down to humanity. Some theologies theologies start at humanity and work their way up to God, right? Uh, There's a book I saw, it's called uh, Cat and Dog Theology, right? Cat theology starts with humanity and works its way up because cats believe they're the centers of the universe, right? right? Dogs, because of their loyalty, they would see... Uh, God first and come down to humanity. I haven't read the whole book, but that's the gist of it, just so you are aware. Uh, The nature, character, and purpose of human beings. So what is it to be human? What does that mean? What value do we have? Why do we have that value? What is our purpose? What are we to be like? The existence, source, and uh, application of absolute moral truth. Right. So we all have a sense of right and wrong. We all have a sense of, of truth and falsehood. Right? In our world, truth is relative. Whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever it is you think is good for you to do at that time, you just go ahead and do it. As believers, we say, no, there is a definitive right and there is a definitive wrong, and that is determined by God himself through his word. Right? So that's very important that we understand that. Uh, the reliability, relevance, and validity of the Bible. Uh, and let me just encourage you in this way, that in order for us to know what God says is right and wrong, we need to know what the Bible actually says, right? That's significant that we understand that. Whether or not people need to be saved from their sins, and if so, how does one get saved? What is that process? Uh, Is there life after death and the dynamics of that experience? Any existing spiritual or supernatural authorities, so angels, demons, and define their powers and domains of influence? And then lastly, what is the definition of success for your life on earth? All of these things fit into our world view. And all of these things will determine how we conduct ourselves in this world and if we are ready or not for what is to come, right? What God promises. So it's very important that we have this sense. Now, I just want to say that uh, as a church board, you know, one of the things that we really want to uh, instill is a solid biblical foundation for the people of Shenstone. We want to be a God-focused, Christ-centered, uh, biblically-founded church. All those things are very important uh, to us. So we're working on rolling out Sunday school again and all of the logistics that come with that. And when we do roll out that Sunday school again, we will be using a curriculum. Uh, it's from Answers in Genesis, but the curriculum will cover all ages. So we will all be learning the same thing at our own age level at the same time, right? And it'll take us right back to the uh, foundational principles of our faith. So please be aware of that. I'm not sure when that's coming, but it is coming. So uh, I'd like to encourage you with that. When John writes uh, this letter, 1 John, He does so to encourage the believers to whom he is writing that they can know for certain the message that they have received from him as an apostle is the true message. Now, they were having some doubts. They were having some challenges. There were some people who were a part of this particular church, and they left that church because they started to believe something different. They started to have a different world view. And not only did they have their own little Uh, new thinking, a new way of thinking, but they were trying to draw the people who were still part of the church away from the church and to go with them. So there's tension in this book. And John is addressing some very real and important and pressing matters. 
Uh, the worldview they had was being challenged. Some people that came into the church uh, started talking about a higher knowledge that, you know, we don't really need to know everything about Jesus. And Jesus probably didn't actually walk on the earth. And he probably even wasn't real in the sense of being a real flesh and blood a person. And you probably don't even need to know Jesus to know God. There's other ways that you can get to know God. And sin is probably not that big a deal, so let's just kind of set that aside. And you know what? We probably haven't even sinned anyway. All right? So these are the ideas that are coming into this church. And, and these young believers are getting a little bit confused. Somebody comes and says that Jesus didn't really come, into, uh, come in the flesh and, and that salvation can be found outside of Jesus and, and that there's really no such thing as sin or sin's not that big a deal, then they get a little confused. This particular group that had left the church was claiming fellowship with God, though their lives didn't show any evidence of it. Right? And that's really critical. The, The people that we are going to listen to, the people that we are going to allow to influence our lives, right, they need to live out what Scripture says. That's really important. Right? That's really important. These people were just trying to set all of that aside. So John writes this short epistle, which is uh, to, to ensure the true message of Jesus is passed on. That's what he wants to do. He wants to make sure that the faith will continue to adhere to its foundation. Now, John is the last apostle, right? All of the other apostles have been martyred for their faith. John eventually ends up on an island called Patmos in exile. But as John reflects over his life, he's probably in his 80s by this point, and he wants to make sure that he he records the truth about Jesus after he's had time to reflect. So he writes about 30 to 40 years after uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have all been written. His writings all come near the end of the first century. And so he looks back on life, and he wants to make sure that the believers have a true understanding of Jesus and what he has done. Now, John, of course, wrote the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is all about Jesus and our environment, right? The Word has become flesh, John chapter 1, and how Jesus came as the Savior of the world. And John wrote his Gospel so that you might believe. In fact, he says near the end of his Gospel that Jesus had done so many miraculous things and taught so many great things that there probably wasn't enough books in the world to contain it all. Right? So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are, are just uh, synopsises, if you will, of the life of Jesus. And then, of course, he writes Revelation. And the Revelation is the Son of God in his environment. That's how uh, Dr. Gerald Bray puts it, that the uh, Gospel of John is Jesus in our environment. Revelation is Jesus in his environment as the conquering king. And he encourages the church to stay faithful because Jesus is coming soon. And then he writes three short letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, to help the church have a Christian world view. So when we come to the Word, we are, re- we are reading about reality through God's eyes, right? Uh, the Bible is not just some old book, hopefully not catching you know, dust on your shelves at home, but it is alive. And it tells us about how God views the world and how God views us and what God has done for us us. It gives us the correct interpretation of the world, and we are seeing things as God sees them when we come to the Bible. And John, of course, witnessed much of the life of Christ. We've talked about that a little bit already, and he wants to record that for us. So John writes to counter the claims of these false teachers and to ensure the message of Jesus is passed on because he wants the church to know. This is a a selection of verses where he's emphasizing our need to know. Uh, 1 John 2, 3, we know that we, what we have, uh, that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. So our beliefs must work out in how we live our lives. Uh, 1 John 2, 5 and 6, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. An emphasis on uh, Jesus and us conforming to his nature. Uh, 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So it is a life 
of sacrificial love. 1 John 3, 24, those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. And 1 John 5 to you, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. So John is setting up this contrast. There are these men over here who are saying, no, no, this is, this is how you're supposed to live. And this is what we know. And John says, no, what they're saying they know is wrong. This is how we know. This is how we know about Jesus. This is how we know those who are in the faith. So John proclaims Jesus, right? He proclaims Jesus. That's what it says in the NIV. Your translation, uh, if you have a different one, may say uh, he is bearing witness. He is testifying. He is giving evidence. That word in the Greek is marturio, right? We get our word martyr from that uh, because a lot of people gave their faith for witnessing about Christ. So our main idea in the passage today is this. The message of the life of Christ brings fellowship and joy with God and one another. The message of the life of Christ brings fellowship and joy with God and with one another. So, three quick points this morning. Christian message does not change, right? The Christian message does not change. It's very important that we understand that because there are a lot of churches out there who are, uh, if they haven't already left the Bible behind, Uh, they have altered the Christian message. And just because they claim to be a church and just because someone claims to be a pastor does not mean that they are actually part of the church and actually teaching what is right and true, right? We have to be uh, very clear on what we believe and that it matches up with what Scripture says. So the Christian message does not change. Billy Graham would always put it this way. He'd say, the message doesn't change. How we communicate that message might change, and that's why he embraced television and radio and film and all of those different things. But the message itself does not change. And the letter begins with a great introduction about who Jesus is, right? uh, John talks about having seen him and heard him, uh, watched him, touched him, and he describes him as the word of life, and he describes uh, that uh, we are proclaiming to you the eternal life. So he's making an interesting comment there about Jesus, isn't he? Because he's not just saying that Jesus is flesh and blood. He's saying that Jesus is eternal, right? That means Jesus has always existed way back into eternity past and will continue to exist all the way into eternity future. But this eternal life actually came to the earth in flesh, and blood, which is a remarkable thing. He begins with that which was from the beginning, and this is a reference uh, to the message given through the life of Christ. He is referring in this context not to the absolute beginning, as he was when he described Jesus as the word in John 1, 1, but to the beginning of the gospel proclamation. It is not to be altered. It is not to be changed. Since Jesus gave it to the apostles, And since the apostles have passed it on to the church, the message is to remain the same. There isn't a new teaching. There isn't a new way of salvation. There is not a different way to God. There is one way to God, and it is through Jesus Christ. How does John know? Or how does John know that this was the message from the beginning? Because he was there, right? John is giving us an eye witness account when uh, there is the miraculous catch of fish john was there Uh, when jesus uh, healed people john was there he saw it in fact john is uh, what we would call one of the inner three and we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later so john heard the message and he saw jesus live the message and he knew the reality of the physical resurrection of christ because john touched him Right? In the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus appears to the disciples, he invites them to touch him. And then later on, when Thomas, who wasn't with the disciples the first time, and he's doubting, and Jesus invites Thomas to touch him, touch my hands, touch my side. Right? The reality of the resurrection is proven by them touching Jesus. The message that John is proclaiming is the life of Jesus himself. And we're going to talk about that more, as I said. John is telling us, about how we can have a transformative relationship with God through Christ 
as opposed to a system of belief. So what these other men were trying to encourage the church to do was to have a system of belief that was different. John is saying, I don't want to give you a system of belief. I want to give you a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what I want you to have. I want you to know Jesus for who he truly is so your life can be very different. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce says this, A system is not life, nor does it transform a life. A system of itself is nothing. What Christianity has and the others do not have is life. In fact, the life of Jesus himself, the one who is the creator and sustainer of all life, and who as the life is also the light of men, it is Christ who is proclaimed in Christianity. Uh, Somebody once put it this way, if you remove Christ from Christian, all you're left with is Ian, and he can't help you very much. (laughs) Right? I have a brother named Ian, so I like that line. It's... (laughs) It's good, right? So these false teachers have infiltrated the church and they've moved away from the life of Christ and they've tried to replace it with their system of higher knowledge available to a select few. You may have heard this term. It's called Gnosticism. It's an early form of Gnosticism. And, and, and there were just these ones who said, we're, we're the knowing ones. We really have the truth. And John says they don't have the truth if they alter the message of Jesus Christ. They are not Christian. There is only one message, and it is built on the life of Christ. The famous BBC journalist Malcolm Uggerge put it this way, it is Christ or nothing. It is Christ or nothing. Second point is this, the Christian message relies on the reality of Jesus. At the end of verse 1, John refers to the word of life And the emphasis here is on that life itself. Because in the very next verse, John begins, the life appeared. Meaning that Jesus arrived and was really real. He was really real. The Christian message relies on the reality of Jesus. Notice the words that John has used. First of all, he says, we, right? It's not just, don't just take my word for it. All of the apostles are teaching the same thing. All of these men that I learned under Christ with, all of these men that that, that were together and witnessed the life of Christ, it is all about that life. We, referring to himself and the other apostles, we heard, we have seen, we have looked at, we have touched, we have seen, we have seen, we have heard. All right, John is emphasizing the reality of, of the incarnate Christ, God in the flesh. That's what incarnate means. Real flesh, real blood. Jesus was real. He was a part of this world in a very significant way. Uh, Remember, John was one of the inner three, which I mentioned, along with Peter and John. And, And they had, or Peter and James, they had greater opportunities than many of the other disciples Uh, A couple weeks ago, we uh, looked at when Jesus raised the widow's son, and that there are three times within the Gospels where Jesus raises somebody from dead to life, right? He raises them. And John witnessed all three of those events, right? Along with Peter and James. When Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, it was just Jesus and her parents, and James, Peter, and John. He was present for all three resurrections, He was on the Mount of uh, Transfiguration when Jesus' glory was temporarily revealed. He was the only disciple to witness Jesus' death on the cross. The only disciple who was there. The others had scattered. So he was there when Jesus died on the cross. When the women came and told the disciples that the grave was empty, it was he and Peter who ran to the tomb. And after he entered the tomb, it says, John saw and believed. That word saw is the same Greek word that John is using in this epistle. And, and that word means to see with understanding. Right? It's that what you see you're able to process and know what it really means. And that's what John is saying. I have seen Jesus. I understand who Jesus really is. And I'm communicating that to you. Included in seeing and hearing, John says he touched Again, we pointed out that Jesus invited his disciples to touch him, to prove that it was him. Remember, they thought it was a ghost, an apparition, 
but it is actually Jesus in the flesh who has risen from the grave. He is a real person. John had many remarkable experiences with him, and it is this person on which our faith is built. It is on this person that our faith is built. Thirdly, only in Jesus do we find fellowship and joy. Uh, Please note, I said earlier, you know, when we looked through all those different things that uh, people believed, uh, somebody said that 64% of proclaiming Christians in the United States say that our religions, uh, religious faiths are of equal value. Please know that anybody who would be uh, a true believer in whatever faith they have, most of them would uh, not agree with that statement, right? Because we all have exclusive truths. We all have things that we believe that are distinct from these other religions. And so when we say only in Jesus do we find fellowship and joy, that is an exclusive statement. That means you cannot find it anywhere else, and that automatically excludes what all the other religions will say to you about how you find fellowship and joy and ultimately uh, salvation. So in the last two verses, John explains his reason for writing. Because he wants these believers to return, to leave their doubt behind, and to experience fellowship with the Father and other believers, and to make their joy complete. Right? Because joy and fellowship is found in Christ. That word fellowship, uh, you may have heard someone say koinonia before. That is the Greek word for fellowship. And it means sharing, uh, partnering with. And there is an emphasis on mutual relationship. And John is saying, look, when we come to Christ, we have fellowship, we have koinonia, we have partnership, we have a a relationship with God the Father through Christ. If you want to know God, the creator of the universe, you know him through faith in Christ. You can have that fellowship with him. You cannot find it any other place. And not only that, but when we have this uh, relationship with God through Christ and we get together with others who also know Jesus and have this fellowship with God through Christ, then we have a unique fellowship that others do not have. Right? Because of who Jesus is and what he has done. And not only do we have this fellowship, which is remarkable enough, but we have Joy. You know, in the early church, uh, when they greeted one another, uh, one of the early greetings was joy. Right? That's how they would meet each other. You know, Hi. Joy. Joy. Why? Because they share that bond, that fellowship together through Christ. Now, clearly, there were struggles in this church that John is writing to, this group of believers. A group of people had, had already left. And they were still trying to influence others to follow them. But John says, no, let us focus on the message that is rooted in the life of Christ. And you can renew that fellowship with God. And and you can strengthen your bonds with one another. Renewing and strengthening their fellowship brings joy. That is what John wanted for them. He did not want them to continue to doubt, continue to worry. He did not want them to be tempted to go with this other group who was filled with influencers who probably had silver tongues who were good at convincing people of things that were not true. John says, no, no, we we want you to have fellowship with the Father and with Jesus Christ. And you can have that only through Christ. And we want your joy to be complete. We want you to have that understanding. So John calls us to walk in the truth, to remember the message that has been proclaimed from the beginning, founded on the life of Jesus, his teaching, his miracles, his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection, and his ascension. All of that comes together. The message of the life of Christ brings fellowship and joy. We don't need to doubt We don't need to get confused. We can be sure as long as we stay focused on Jesus. That's what John 
is trying to get across to us. And that is what he will continue to communicate to us as we walk through this short five-chapter epistle. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, how wonderful it is that we can have fellowship with you. And we can have fellowship with Jesus Christ because of what he has done for us, because of the life he lived, the perfect life without sin. A life that led him to death on the cross so our sins could be forgiven, so he could take that punishment on our behalf, so that we could be freed from our bondage in sin, from our slavery, so that Jesus could uh, impute to us, give to us that righteousness which we cannot gain on our own. And through his resurrection, where he conquers sin and death, that we too are able to have sin and death conquered. To know that eternal life is ours. Lord, when we have that fellowship with you, we are granted this wonderful fellowship with other believers, and our joy can be complete. What a wonderful thing to know. Lord, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful for this a short little epistle that we are going to go through over the next few weeks. And I pray that it will be an encouragement to us that will help us to stay focused on you and the truth that can only be found in you. We pray these things in your son's holy and precious name.